a Hollywood film salutes the American working man. Behold labor's triumph, the smooth listening body of machine, the song of victory. Here is no straining of human flesh, the spirit of steel, the joyous chant of motion, the exultant twirling of spinning wheels, the thunder of a tiring system. It is the song of the dynamo. It is the song that labor sings in tribute to science and invention. Higher profits are being generated as fast as new machinery and production methods are introduced. But the greatest single advance is mass production itself through the moving assembly line. Starting in the car industry, the assembly line is transforming the daily lives of millions of people. Never before has a change in the way people work brought so much wealth, but also so much alienation and conflict. By the start of the 20th century, the great shift from the country to the cities was well underway. In Europe, the best paid workers were those who'd moved to the new factories that produced the heavy machinery of the industrial age. The most respected were those whose combined physical strength and skill had taken years to acquire. Boilermakers, riveters, foundrymen. As the age of steam gave way to electricity and oil, the nature of the work to be done changed too. Small engines needed a new type of precision. The skilled men who built them belonged to craft unions and worked at their own pace. Despite the manufacturer's hopes, this was not to be the century of the motorbike. The new machine that would do most to change both the world and the way people worked was the car. Thousands of craftsmen worked for the many companies competing for a share of the new market before the First World War. In Britain, the Vulcan Motor Company were proud to film the way their workers assembled cars so slowly, by hand. Charles Hill started as a Vulcan apprentice when he was 14. Everybody seemed to be busy doing something, and it was only... Uh, as you went through and going through it yourself, you realize that every man was in a, one sense a specialist in his own particular job. There were men, skilled men there when I went there. They were there all their life to the dying day. All skilled craftsmen in their own sphere. In the body shop there was a lot of wood framing of the motor car body. And then there was panel beaters who, to take the shape of panels on a car, it was done with hammers to bend them round and make bulbous corners. It was all done with a planishing hammer. Craftsmen controlled the way they did their work. The whole process took several weeks from start to finish 
and they took pride in the results. You were walking down Lord Street, the main town, and see these cars, cars that you'd actually worked on, and people riding in cars. And cars were more of a novelty than they are today. And it gave you an ego. It was a time when a wide gulf separated those who built cars from those who bought them. But the days when cars were just luxuries for the rich were drawing to a close. America now set the pace in engineering and production. European managers and workers knew that what was happening in American factories pointed the way of the future. And in 1908, one man had a vision that would change manufacturing and create a new market. Henry Ford set out to make the simplest car ever, a car for rural America, a 20th century equivalent of the covered wagon. Ramble right along and the little old Ford Ramble right along, the gas ran out in the big machine But the darn little Ford don't need gasoline The big limousine had to back down the hill But the plain little Ford is going up still When it runs out of dope, just fill it up with soap And the little Ford will ramble right along To produce the Model T as cheaply as he wanted Ford knew he had to change the way cars were built That meant changing the way his workers worked As he reorganized his factory to turn out Model Ts, he was influenced by the efficiency expert, Frederick Taylor. Taylor had complained that hardly a workman can be found who doesn't devote his time to studying just how slowly he can work. And then he devoted his life to speeding them up. When Taylor was brought in, he first timed the workers with stopwatches and noted every movement they made. In a famous experiment at an ironworks, he reorganized a worker called Schmidt. Previously, Schmidt had hand-carried 12 tons of pig iron a day up from a wagon. After Taylor rearranged things, the forbearing Schmidt found himself carrying 47 tons, and production had been raised 300%. Called into an office, Taylor helped the world's fastest typist type even faster. The new world record of 150 words a minute was achieved by Margaret Owen, but Taylor claimed much of the credit. At Ford's factory, Taylorism meant dividing car production into simple, repetitive steps. There was to be no need for skilled craftsmen with years of apprenticeship. Men could learn to do any job quickly. A trained wheelwright no longer made each wheel in its entirety. Wheel making was broken down into almost a hundred stages, done by different men at different machines. It was much faster, but workers could still complete only 200 cars a day. So in 1913, Ford introduced his most revolutionary change yet. In those days, each car was built from the frame up on stationary wooden horses. Later, the company filmed a reconstruction of how Ford tried out his new idea. Henry Ford watched it for a while, then he had an inspiration. Instead of moving the men past the cars, why not move the cars past the men? So on one hot August morning, they tried it that way. A husky young fellow put a rope over his shoulder and Henry Ford called, let's go. And at that very moment, as the workmen began to fasten the parts onto the slowly moving car, the assembly line was born. To deliver the parts to the exact point on the line, engineers put in a network of clanking conveyors. They were running uh, 
Well, the length of the building, like, you know. Like carrying the parts, instead of you carrying it by hands, why the conveyors would carry it on the, on the lines. And it was really marvelous the way things moved. That uh, not one brain was doing that. There was a lot of brains working together. The workers became an integrated part of the great machine. And the management set the speed it ran at without discussion or negotiation, for unions were forbidden. The men faced new pressure as the final assembly line beat out the rhythm for the whole factory. There was no way they could stop or slow it down. Few stood the pace and din for long. Men tried it for a few weeks and then quit. But Ford had an answer. The company was making record profits. The time taken to build each car had dropped to one and a half hours so he could afford to raise pay. When he announced he was doubling wages to the unheard of level of $5 a day, the factory was besieged by applicants. Red Cole was 18 when he started at Ford. The thing about Mr. Ford that, in, that stuck in my mind mostly was that he started to pay $5 a day. And Mr. Ford to me was like a god. He was like a god, and he, because he had control of so many thousands of people, and he had them in such order, the, the, the lines, the production lines, the, the coming and going, the shifts, three shifts, eight hours each shift, days, afternoons, and midnights. And everything to me was so clockwork that I was so proud to be a part of it. I loved it. By 1920, Detroit was a boom town. Its population had grown fourfold since 1900. Other car makers adopted the Ford method. His recipe, mass production, low costs, high wages, was creating not only cheap cars, but well-paid workers. Ford built a new factory, which was the largest in the world. At the River Rouge plant, coal, iron, sand and rubber were delivered at one end and 2,500 Model Ts a day streamed out of the other. Up to 80,000 men worked there. I was lost, you know, I was really lost with the size of it and the noise of it and uh, where you hung your clothes, uh, where you ate your lunch, where did you put your lunch. You, you just, you just didn't know, and and uh, you was afraid to go any place. Seeing these fellows doing one thing, somebody else is doing another thing, and all this different machinery. It was amazing to see all this. It was amazing. Above all, it was the constant supply of new men arriving in Detroit that made it possible. The company set the terms, provided they worked fast and obeyed orders they got the wages. Over 70% were recent immigrants, so the company had its own language schools. And Ford played the different groups off against each other, Italians and Poles, Germans and Greeks, white American and black, to keep up the speed. They said, nigger, if you don't want to keep that, get that production, we got some hunkies out here, and Miller Road will do it. They'd go back to a southern white guy, and they said, look, if you crackers can't get this production, we got some dagos and some niggas out there on Miller Road can do the same, we'll, we'll take your job. Ford's private security force, the Plant Protection Service, kept discipline. Anyone who recruited for the unions was fired. Company spies kept a lookout for those considered to be troublemakers. Instead, Ford stressed all the material benefits high pay could bring. Workers were encouraged to put part of their wages aside each week towards their own car in a company-run savings scheme.
rich, you know. <laughs> you can afford this, you can afford that, you can afford a new car. In 1924, the 10 millionth Model T rolled off the line. Ford's advertising department made the most of it. As the car was driven from coast to coast, it crossed a country that was being transformed by the moving assembly line. For America, the 1920s were the start of a consumer society in which a whole range of new products came within reach of ordinary people. Factories now turned out furniture and ready-made clothes. Electric appliances were cheaper than ever before. The cycle had started. Mass production was feeding mass consumption, leading to yet more production. The radio had almost as great an impact as the car, bringing advertising and popular music into the home. When a Philadelphia company wanted to make the cheapest wireless yet, they took on a new workforce. They needed no experience or electrical knowledge, so long as they were nimble enough to put the small parts together. Margaret Colombo's only qualification was that she'd played the mandolin. He looked at my hands, and I, and I had the long fingers. And believe it or not, when I went there, there was three others besides me, and I was the fourth one went in there, and they all had long fingers. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he, knew, he knew that's what he wanted. He wanted the fingers. Yeah. The work was so easy to pick up that Philco workers sometimes swapped jobs just to vary the routine. When you're sitting in one spot and you're doing a, the same job for a couple of hundred sets, that, that's a lot of... And it got boring and, and some of them just didn't, wasn't, wasn't cut out for it. Yet I had other girlfriends that liked it. The compensation for the relentless tedium was the high wages. By the mid-twenties, one in five Americans owned a car, a figure that Britain wouldn't equal for another 40 years. It was a Ford Model T with a rumble seat. That's the kind of a car with black. And uh, you take your friends out and they get blown all apart in the rumble seat. But, oh, I, I had a lot of fun with that car. At the end of the decade, there were already 29 million cars on America's roads, and half of them were Model Ts. The affordable car changed where people lived, where they worked, how they shopped, how they spent their leisure. Not all Americans could achieve this standard of living, but the ones who did became the envy of the rest of the world, 